Experience. I'm Pastor Willie Vaughn, and I want to wish you a very Merry Christmas. And thank you for joining with me in this weekend as we open up God's Word together. I hope in our time together you are encouraged, you are inspired, and you're built up in your faith as we look into God's Word together. Would you just close your eyes with me as we ask God to join us in this time. Heavenly Father, we do bless you and praise you. We thank you for the joy of this season that you give us, and we thank you for your Word. And we ask, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts in this time as we open up your Word together, Lord, that you might do something new and great and fresh in us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. It's the most wonderful time of the year. It's a time when we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And I love that this time of year is not, even as we celebrate Jesus' birth, it's not one day, but we give it a whole month and we celebrate the entire story. Of course, every year we have to look at different aspects, get to look at different aspects of what that story says and means to us in a fresh way. So today I want to read to you from Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, this familiar story of the three wise men, the Magi. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born the King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard, that he was dis heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, Report to me that I, too, may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way. And the star that they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the, when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. I love how we celebrate the birth of Jesus. And again, it's that story where we take a whole month to celebrate it. But each one of us has a story of our birth. You know, how does your story start out? I love how Matthew says in this passage, he begins this chapter, says, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi came from the east to Jerusalem. How would your story go? Here's something like what my story would be like. And Will Vaughn was born in Sussex, New Jersey, during the time that Jimmy Carter was president. And we always have these, I don't know if you've ever gone into a store and they have, you know, what you look for your birth year and all the things that were happening in history and what was going on the year that you were born. And Matthew points out this significant event. He says, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem. This is what happened when Jesus was born. Now, of course, many of you who might be vaguely familiar with this story might not know the details. And see, understanding that this happened over a period of time. Most um, in our nativity scenes, we see the shepherds and we see Mary and Joseph and the, the wise men. But if you really study the Bible and the timeline, most people believe that the wise men didn't show up at the stable they didn't come there to see Jesus in a manger, but it could have been about two years later when they actually showed up. And so why did it take two years? Well, as we look at this story, there's a lot of mystery in it. It seems there's more mystery than details. And we see God is interrupting the lives of so many different people with the birth of Jesus. God has a, a habit of doing that. He loves to interrupt our lives. That's his priority. That's his prerogative. And when Jesus shows up, whether historically or personally, he's worthy of stealing the show. He is that rising star. The question we have to ask ourselves is, will we recognize him? And how will we react? And when God interrupts your life, sometimes 
He has to show up in a, an amazing way, even when you're far from him, in order to draw you close. Sometimes he has to interrupt you with something foreign, so you take a step back and see what's right there in front of you. And sometimes God puts things, puts people in your life to help you appreciate the significance of things going on. Here in this story, we have three different sets of characters. We have the wise men, we have the priests, the religious people, the teachers of the law, and we have King Herod. And if we're honest, when we look at this story, we could see a little bit of ourselves in each of these in the way that we handle life's interruptions. So how do we handle life's interruptions? Well, obviously, the first and foremost, it's the understanding of these wise men. And again, that question, why did it take them two years to get there? But that's about life's interruptions, isn't it? You see, the wise men were most likely from Persia, Babylon, you know, it's modern day Iran, and they had to travel to Israel. Now, of course, I did some figuring and configuring, and it's about 1,500 miles from Babylon to Israel. And so, going by camel, you can go about 18 miles a day. And of course, you had to take time to set up tents and stuff. So, about how long would it take? And so, I came up with a very special formula to say it would probably almost be exactly between two months and one year travel time. But that still doesn't line up with our timeline being two years. So why did it take so long? But here's the understanding. Like I said, when God interrupts our lives, we're usually not waiting for it. We're not sitting around. The, the wise men weren't sitting around like, okay, the camels are packed. We got our gifts. We're ready to go. Just waiting on this star. No, they looked up into the sky and they noticed a star. And then they had to figure out why. The first journey they had to make was a journey of the mind. And the wise men were looking up and they had to see why. And I think the wise men got, when their life was interrupted, when they saw the sty, sky interrupted and a new star was formed, they said, this has got to be something significant. And they're probably very superstitious and they had to ponder and they had to think. And this is the beauty of the story. See. A fool, when he's interrupted, will complain, but a wise man will ponder. And so the wise men had to ponder. They had to take this journey of the mind. I think the wise men probably got what I like to call a case of the maybes. I think we all get that, right? When God interrupts our lives, we can get a case of the maybes. Well, maybe God is doing this, or maybe God is trying to say that. And the only problem with a case of the maybes is it tends to be a symptom of a greater issue in our lives. Maybe a symptom of a lack of relationship with Jesus Christ. You see, I think when we get a case of the maybes, it's okay to stay there, get there, but not to stay there. Understand that God wants to speak to us. He wants to answer our questions. If the Magi had stayed in their, that state of the, the maybes, they never would have gotten to Bethlehem. They wouldn't have been able to travel 1,500 miles and end up at the exact address where Jesus was. No one makes that big of a journey and ends up at a pinpoint destination on a maybe or a hunch or a guess. They had to do their research. Some people think that a case of the maybes, well, it just they ignore it until it goes away. They have this idea in, our, in their minds that God just is like a little kid throwing stones into a pond and the ripples affect us, but we can't ask any questions. Now, I'm not going to tell you that God gives us every detail and every answer to every question that we ask. Sometimes with some answers, we do have to wait to heaven until we get there. But the God I know is the God who wants to reveal himself. He doesn't just interrupt us. When he interrupts our lives, it's like the Holy Spirit sneaking up on us and tapping us on the shoulder and saying, excuse me. And he wants to give us a reason. In John 15, 15, Jesus specifically said, I no longer call you servants, but I call you friends. Because a servant doesn't know his master's business. But I reveal to you everything the Father has told me. See, God wants to reveal himself. The God I know, the God of the Bible, inspired many writers to give us the words of Scripture so that we could know him. He spoke to the prophets and had them speak to the people. And I love how Hebrews 1 says, In times past, God spoke in many ways at different times through the prophets. But in these last days, God has spoken to us through His Son. Through His Son, Jesus. God wants to speak to you and answer your questions. 
God doesn't interrupt your life in a powerful way and then say you had to try to figure it out all on your own and just ponder the maybes. But he wants you to study, to search, and to ask for the reason for the interruption. 2020 has been a year of interruptions. Have we ever stopped and asked, what is God up to? What is he trying to do in us as a country, as a world, and as individuals? One of my favorite verses is Romans 12 too, which says, Do not be conformed any longer to the patterns and the ways of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And get this. He says, Then you will know what the will of God is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. You allow your mind to be renewed, to study the way these wise men did. They probably studied ancient texts and scriptures. They probably had some of the passages from the Old Testament when the Jews had been carried off into exile into Babylon. You remember the story of Daniel, how influential he was? And they probably had some of those stories and they could look at passages like Numbers that talks about a star appearing. And they got it. They said this significant happening, this significant event in the sky is God interrupting history and a newborn king coming. What did they say to King Herod? They said, where is this newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star when it arose. And so they made this journey, and they came. But the story continues. And I, and I love how God speaks through his word. Magi came from the east, and they came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one born the king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. It's almost like they, they got everything real ready. They knew a newborn king had been born. They knew this was a significant event that God had let the star come into the sky. And they headed out in faith, but they didn't know exactly where they were going. You ever have God speak to you like that? You feel him speaking so clearly. This is what I'm doing. This is what I want from you. This is my word for your life. And you step out in faith and you begin on that journey and then you get lost in the wilderness. You get lost in the darkness. The, the wise men were following this star and I don't know what happened. It doesn't say in the story. Like I said, it's a mystery, but maybe at some point they get from Babylon to Israel and all of a sudden... What happens when you look up at the sky and it's cloudy at night and the stars are gone? And God lets us into those periods of darkness. And it's okay to seek counsel in those times. It's okay to find someone else and say, hey, can you help me with this? And thankfully, the wise men were wise men and not too stubborn to ask for directions as some of us are, myself included. They went to Jerusalem, the capital city, and they went to the king, King Herod, and they said, where is this newborn king? And then... They were pointed to Bethlehem. It's that understanding that sometimes, even when we step out of faith, even when we know we heard God clearly, even when everything seemed clear, we might go through a period of darkness. We might need to be reaffirmed to get back on our way. Then, it says in verse 10, when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. They went on ahead and saw the child. And it was like the star reappeared right over the house, and they ended up right where they needed to be. When we talk about the interruptions of life, are you like the wise men who ponder the reason, or are you like the fool who complains? And of course, then there's the next group of people in our story. It's the religious people. The wise men came, and they asked Herod, where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star when it arose. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed in all of Jerusalem with him. And he called together the people's chief priests and the teachers of the law, and he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. I love seeing nativity scenes all over the place and decorations at this time of year. We just, Jesus is everywhere. And there's a joy in that. Don't you love the nativity scene? And there's 
Joseph and Mary in this little barn, this stable, and the baby Jesus lying in the manger in the hay. You have the cows and the sheep, and you have the shepherds sitting there and they're worshiping. You have the, the wise men with their gifts and they're bowing down before the king. And you have the priests lined up just so excited. Wait, you, you don't have priests in your nativity? You, you, you mean the wise men traveled 1,500 miles by camel? And they get there and they make this announcement to the king and the king gathers all the teachers and the religious people and the priests and the scribes and, and everybody and he says, well, you know, this Messiah, he was born, you know, where, where is he going to be? And they say, oh yeah, yeah, and he, he's going to be in Bethlehem. And then the magi, the wise men, travel the rest of the way. But the priests, the religious people, can't be bothered to make the two-hour hike to go six miles to see their Emmanuel. Now, of course, we love to point, don't we? And we love the stories in the gospel, you know, where Jesus gets in those tangles with the Pharisees and he calls them out. We kind of cheer them on and we get a little grin inside when we hear Jesus calling the, the teachers, you whitewashed tombs, you hypocrites. We're like, yeah, give it to him, Jesus. And we never stop and ask, wait, Jesus, are you talking to me? If we're ever honest with ourselves and say, but for the grace of God, so do I. You see, these priests and these Pharisees, these are the people who should have been most excited about Emmanuel, Jesus born, God with us. And yet they were so caught up in their lives. You know, Christmas time is a busy time of year. And we have the, the traditions and we have the turkey and the eggnog and the cranberry sauce and we got to cut down the tree and string up the lights and buy the gifts and wrap the presents and sing the songs and send the cards. Does anyone do that anymore? Send out Christmas cards? No. But we have all these activities and almost, it could almost stress you out if you let it. It's almost as if in our current culture, this very season meant to celebrate Jesus and his birth could end up pulling us farther away from him rather than drawing us close. And so, yeah, we could wag our figure, fingers at the Pharisees in this story, and yet, is that us? Should we be the ones most excited? You know, I can't get mad at a world who wants to push Jesus out because they don't know him and they've never met him, but if we as Christians, are we really focusing on the central point? Where are the Pharisees when Jesus was born? And two, for two years, they were right up the road. Well, they were too busy in the palace pandering to the politicians. Wow. You see, that was part of the New Testament thing, even in Jesus' time. See, the Jewish people, they were looking for a political savior. They weren't looking for a baby in a manger. And yet when Jesus interrupts our lives... Doesn't he do so in such an unassuming, different way than we expect? He never meets our expectations, does he? Maybe in this Christmas story, we should aspire to be more like the shepherds than the priests. Yeah, these priests, they had it all together. They were impressive. Herod asked, hey, where's the Messiah to be born? And bam, right off the top of their head, Micah 5, 2, and 4. Old Testament prophet writer, 700 years earlier, a minor prophet. Do you know Micah? I like to read Isaiah, Jeremiah, you know, some of the big prophets, but who, who's Micah? Where, where does he come in? And yet these religious people, they, they knew everything, chapter and verse. You know the people, and there's nothing wrong with memorizing Scripture. It is important. It is powerful. But if we memorize Scripture and we do all the studying and know all the facts and aren't aware of the most important thing going on around us, We've missed it. Sometimes I think we need to put down our Bibles and stop studying what we want to know so we can start living out what we already do know. You know, even Christian education can be just come religious entertainment if we never take the time to apply it to our lives. You know, Jesus says in John 14, 6, there you go again, Will, showing off with knowing the chapter and verse. But he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He says, I'm the way. 
I'm not a Sunday morning hobby. I'm a lifestyle. We can get so caught up in our other things and, and knowing and learning and getting the facts straight and feeling so built up and puffed up and proud of ourselves because we memorize the Lord's Prayer and miss out on Jesus when He's trying to interrupt our lives. Maybe in this season, God is saying to you, are you willing to let me interrupt your life? To interrupt church? To interrupt your traditions? And your singing and your plays and all the things you've always done so that I can do something new and great in your life. But then we also have Herod. The Magi came and asked him, where is this newborn king of the Jews? And when Herod heard this, in verse 3, it says, he was disturbed and all of Jerusalem with him. He was disturbed. Well, that's an interesting word. You know the rest of the story, right? When the Magi go and they, they're so excited and they're overjoyed and they bow down and worship Jesus and they give their gifts and yet they're warned in a dream not to go back to Herod. So they, they leave and go back to their home by a different route. Herod was disturbed. Jesus showed up and interrupted his life, and it says he was disturbed. Amazingly, here, the king of Judea at the time, under the Roman overlordship, refused to accompany the kings to go worship the king of kings. The king refused to accompany the kings to worship the king of kings. Instead, he was disturbed. And here we can go, and yeah, that must have been evil. And you know how Herod reacted. He had all the children, all the young boys under the age of two killed in order to protect his dynasty. Man, he was disturbed. Violent, evil, wicked. But how do you and I act when our life gets interrupted? How do you act when some jerk cuts you off in traffic? Do the words come out of your mouth that you wouldn't use on a Sunday morning? You and I get a little disturbed sometimes when we're inconvenienced, when we're bothered, when life in is interrupted. Why is that? Maybe we get disturbed because when things don't go our way, we lose control. Herod here was the king, but he knew he was the appointed king. See, there's the difference, isn't it? The wise men were looking for the newborn king of the Jews, the king who was born. Herod wasn't even really Jewish. He was from the descendants of Edom. And he was appointed king. He was kind of just set up as king. He didn't have a rightful throne. He wasn't in the lineage of the royal family in Israel. And he knew that his control was so fragile, he was threatened by it. Sometimes when we're interrupted, when God interrupts our lives, we become so aware of our own inadequacy. So aware that we don't deserve the influence that we have. And we try all the harder to hold on to control. We can get disturbed. Why do we get attitudes? Why do we get angry when we're inconvenienced or when we're questioned? This, for me, this is hitting home. When people ask me questions or say, well, why don't you do it this way? I know full well, even in the capacity that I'm at, that I'm not qualified. And yet God has given me influence. It's an understanding that we have to always remember. God has appointed us in the place that we're at. But he is the legitimate king over every situation. He's the king of the world. They call Santa the king of the North Pole. But God's the king of it all. Jesus is the king of it all. And sometimes when we're all, our life is interrupted, we can get angry, we can get disturbed because we know we don't have all the answers. We know we don't have it all figured out. And we get angry, we get scared, we get upset. And we get very disturbed. We act out in ways that don't honor God. Oh, sure, it's e easy to point out King Herod. Well, he's wicked and he's evil. Look at how bad he does. But do we do that in such a way just to make ourselves feel better? Or do we realize that everyone who's not following Jesus 
this evil and wicked. We were all once enemies of God. And yet God showed his love for us by sending his son to die in our place. Someone came to Jesus one time in his ministry and said, Good teacher, what can I do to inherit eternal life? And he, Jesus himself said, Why do you call me good? Only God is good. If we're honest, you and I aren't good. And we love to point out somebody else who's worse so we can feel better. But if we're honest, sometimes when life is interrupted, we realize our inadequacy. We realize our sinfulness. We realize how disturbed we get and how easily we can become angered even when we don't have a right to be. How do you handle interruptions? Herod went out of his way to fight God. And sometimes we do too. God's interrupting our lives and he wants to make a change and he wants to do something great like when Jesus was born to save the world. And we don't know and we don't understand and we're threatened and we're scared and so we act out and we fight God's plan. But I love how Paul is telling his story in Acts 26. And he says, God says, you can't fight against me. To fight against me is useless. We can't fight God. Herod tried. And sometimes that's how we act when God interrupts our lives. He wants to do something great. He wants to do something better. And instead, we fight him. How do you act when Jesus interrupts your life? I think we can all act in different ways at different times. And if anything, 2020 has been the year to reveal our own hidden weaknesses. When God has interrupted our lives, we can react in many different ways. Maybe God's using this to help us grow to become better. If we're honest, sometimes we act like Herod and we fight God. Sometimes we act like the religious people that we can be. And we just ignore God and go about our business. But every once in a while, we're called to be like the wise men. Not to complain like fools, but to ponder and research and think and ask why. We're talking about the wise men's journey. And one thing I love most about this is the reason the wise men got it. Their lives were interrupted, but they were able to figure it out. And this is why. They looked up. They looked up to the heavens and they saw the star. You know, sometimes when God interrupts our lives, we're so busy looking around that we miss it. As Jesus is looking to interrupt your life in this year, in this season, as we celebrate his birth, I hope that you take the time to stop like the wise men did and just look up to spend some time celebrating him to reflect on how you can better handle God's interruptions to your life, knowing that he wants to do something great, wonderful, like you've never seen before. I hope you trust him. Thank you again for joining me. I hope this message encouraged you, but I also want to tell you, you stay with me for a couple minutes more about the most important and powerful way Jesus wants to interrupt your life. Again, here's hoping you have a blessed and Merry Christmas until I see you again. Hey guys, thanks for sticking around with me. It really is the most wonderful time of the year. And I hope you're being blessed by our Life Interrupted series. But I want you to think for a moment, even as we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ, do you know what we're celebrating? You know, we always have all these traditions. We have the baby in the manger and the nativity and the gifts. And we talk about the shepherds and the wise men. But what is it really about? What makes this, year, this type of year so special? It's a focus on Jesus. This baby in a manger, born of a virgin, this miraculous birth. But why did he come? Did he come just to give us gifts? Or did it come for something more? See, this is the beginning of a story that is life-changing and transforming. God so loved the world that He sent His one and only Son that if whoever would believe in Him would not perish but have everlasting life. See, this baby that was born in a manger came to interrupt your life. 
He came to live life perfectly, knowing that you and I have it. And in our place, he lived a perfect life in order to restore a relationship with God. And then when he became a man, he taught how to live. He taught what God wanted for us and what the kingdom of God was like, what heaven was like, and what God expected from us, but also what God wants for us. God desires so much to have a relationship with you. And then Jesus died on the cross. The punishment for the sin you and I committed, our rejection of God, our rejection of His perfect law. We've all been enemies of God and deserved a punishment. And yet Jesus came to take that punishment on Himself so that we don't have to die. That when we leave this world, we can live with Him forever in eternity. And that we might have a relationship with Him through His Son. Jesus came as that baby in the manger to grow up to be a man, to give us the greatest gift of all, eternal life and a relationship, a reconciled, a healed relationship with God our Creator. If you've been watching and you're sticking around, maybe God has interrupted your life in a, in a way and He's trying to get your attention right now. And I want to ask you, do you know Jesus personally? Jesus coming into this world was the result and the answer of a prophecy, a prophecy fulfilled that he would be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. And Jesus wants to be with you even as he's with each one of those who call upon his name. Do you know this man Jesus? Do you know his voice? In 1 John it says we have the Bible and these things are written that we might know that we have eternal life. Do you know that you're going to live forever with him? Maybe Jesus is allowing interruptions into your life right now to wake you up, to catch your attention because He wants to have a relationship with you. Maybe you're listening to this message and it's just speaking to your heart. The Holy Spirit, God can do that. He speaks through people and through videos and through all different ways and He says, hey, I'm trying to reach you. He's knocking on the door of your heart right now. And he's tapping on your shoulder. He says, I have something for you. And all it takes to receive this gift is to confess and say, you know what, I've made a mess of my life. I haven't lived by your ways, God. It's to say, I believe that this baby who was born became a man and grew up and died for me and was raised again so that I would have a hope that when I die, I too will be raised again to life and live with God forever. And to say, you know what, this newborn king is the king that I want to be king of my life. I want to make my Lord and Master. If you're ready to say that, if you're ready to invite Jesus into your heart, I just invite you to close your eyes and just take a moment, take a deep breath and repeat this prayer after me. Jesus, I confess to you I've made mistakes, I've messed up, and I've done things that I'm not proud of. I've done things that you know about that don't honor you, that aren't good. And I want you to forgive me. I ask for your forgiveness. Jesus, I believe you did really come into this world that these stories are true. It happened in a real time, in a real place to real people. And that you grew up, you lived a life that was perfect and you died for me. And I believe that it's true that you were raised to life again on the third day. I want you to forgive me. I ask that you come into my life, that your spirit would come into my heart, that you would speak to me and teach me and help me to be a better person. And I want to give you complete and total control of my life. I want you to lead me and teach me from this day forward. I ask that you would do this, Lord, and speak to my heart even now, that I might know that I have a relationship with you because I want to live with you forever. Amen. If you prayed that prayer and you felt the warmth of God just come over you, I encourage you, keep looking for these messages. Find a way to get connected with church. Maybe you know someone in your family, someone in your friends has been praying for you. Let them know that you gave your life to Jesus today. Get yourself a Bible. Reach out to us. Contact us. We'd love to encourage you. And continue to listen to His voice. To look up and seek Him. And look for the ways that He's interrupting your life to make you better and to give you the great adventure that He wants you to have. Again, thank you. May God bless you and a very Merry Christmas.